funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. The Great Irish Famine from 1845 to 1850 was Ireland's greatest disaster. Blight repeatedly devastated potato crops and led to a colossal loss of life and mass emigration to the United States and elsewhere. So just who was to blame for this famine? This is a question which has vexed Irish historians for over a century and a half, with some pinning the blame solidly with the British government and others less so. Nicholas O'Griefa, local historian from Ring in County Watford. I, I always liked to never see anyone being wronged, you see. And, and uh, the people of this parish were, were definitely wrong. The, the whole Irish people, I suppose, were wrong with the famine. There was no need for a famine in Ireland, you see. If the government that was in England at the time, they say it was a Dublin, which sure it was England anyway, if they played their part and saw what was happening in Ireland, I mean, we'd never have a famine, because you must remember the wheat in our country and the most of the fish that was caught around our coastline was exported to London. A lot of the fish caught in Baron Nagao was, was, used to have to go up to Yall, you know, by, by road and by boat, to be sent over to Liverpool. It was not a natural famine because the country was full of food. Shiploads of animals and, and corn were leaving the country while people were still starving. It was that people were dependent on one crop and that had failed. That was Not that there was a shortage of food within the country because quite a bit of the food left the country in ships to go abroad. Local historian Bridie John from Clonacadu in County Leash. Here's Nicholas O'Griefa. That's the point about the famine. Like I mean, our fish was exported, our wheat was gone from us and all. I mean, in 1847, we had a big clash with, in Dungarvan with Le- Liam Ned Power. He was killed in the square in Dungarvan over the boats down in the quay were being loaded with wheat to bring it over to England. And there was right in the square in Dungarvan and Liam Power was killed in it. So does responsibility for well over a million deaths and the widespread emigration of over a million people from Ireland lie solely with the British government of the day? Believe it or not, some contemporary observers during the famine thought that the British government was doing too much for Ireland. County Curry based historian and journalist T. Ryle Dwyer. The American ambassador in Britain at the time announced that Britain was finished because they were trying to do too much to relieve the Irish famine. It's actually, you know, I mean, there was this, I forget his name now, but the ambassador, he was gloating, really, that Britain is finished, because they're doing too much to try and fight the famine, that their contribution. And that's not what we would ever hear here. Did the British authorities do as much as they possibly could at the time, I think if you research it, I think you would have to accept that they did what they could do and what they felt was appropriate at the time. And I think we have been in the past too critical of them in thinking that they did nothing and that the English people were very generous, in fact, OK? Quaker societies were very good and the, even the church bodies in England, they all contributed and made vast contributions uh, to help the Irish, you know. Uh, we have to accept some responsibilities ourselves. County Clare historian Frank Taff. Here's Catherine Shannon, Professor of History at Westfield State University in Massachusetts, USA. That's one thing that in the kind of Irish-American folk memory of the famine, it all is blamed on the British government and Trevelyan. And there's no recognition of the fact uh, that so many British people helped and assisted. The story of the famine is, is not black and white. Certainly there are many sections of the community who are culpable of blame, just like the British government are. Dr Kieran O'Reilly, Maynooth University historian and author of the book Strokestown and the Great Irish Famine. So I think unless we, we dig deeper into that and examine local communities on a larger scale, we won't actually get the, the, the crux of, of the issue with the Great Famine. 
What is clear from prior comments is that much debate and differences of opinion exist among modern historians over who is to blame for the Great Irish Famine. If the British government weren't fully to blame, then who else was? What other factors were at play? What about the Irish landlord class? How negligent were they? Or what about other groupings such as the Irish Catholic middle class? In this programme we plan to try answer these questions and by so doing hopefully separate fact from myth as well as try confront stereotypes which have perpetuated for over a century and a half. However, before doing this, first we need to briefly examine the famine's roots. In the 200 years prior to the famine, most of Ireland's Catholics were dispossessed of their land. As a result, by the 1840s they lived on unsustainable land holdings, with their main source of food being the potato. Willie Henry, Galway City historian and author of the book Famine, Galway's Darkest Years. The people were too dependent on the potato at the time, you know. And of course, the potato was cheap. Let's be honest about it. It was cheap to cultivate. It was a, it was a great source of protein. They had it for breakfast, dinner, and supper, so to speak. And it's, so that every Irish peasant had access to it. It also helped them pay bills. So it was really one of the crops that they needed. And because so many people depended on the potato, when potato blight struck in 1845, it caused a national disaster. So just how did the government react? Liam Kennedy, Professor Emeritus of Economic and Social History at Queen's University, Belfast. The first year of the famine, British government interventions are quite effective. That's under Sir Robert Peel. The real problems begin in the summer of 1846, the beginning of the second harvest of failure, when you have a Whig government... Ironically, the Whig government is favourably disposed towards Ireland, but is wedded to a very doctrinaire form of political economy, minimise the role of the state, responsibility for famine relief should be devolved to the poor law unions and ultimately the, the workhouses. So why did the new British government, led by Lord John Russell, which took over from Robert Peel in 1846, adopt a minimalist, or do as little as possible, approach to helping Ireland? Dr Jerry Morn, Research Fellow at the Social Science Research Centre in NUI, Galway. The Russell administration was largely a coalition, a coalition which found it very difficult to make decisions. It was a coalition which was composed of radicals, of Whigs, but also those Conservatives who had opposed Peel's Corn Laws. As a result, from 1846 right up to the end of the famine, Lord John Russell, who a lot was expected of when he comes into power in 1846, is really not in a position to be able to do anything. What occurs is that the Russell administration, to a very large extent, decides to allow the Treasury and Sir Charles Trevelyan to run the whole relief operations with regards to Ireland. While you have a famine of food, you also have a famine in politics, largely because you don't have a strong administration that is able to make decisions with regards to relief operations in Ireland. The curse of death is in the air It falls on Aaron's children fair For breath that once gave them life Is now a word for hunger and strife Months pass on, death circle spreads Famine's grip is drawing nigh When every day sees darkened homes With endless coffins passing by Skeletons lie across the land, scattered there by hunger's hand. No wail of family lament their loss, no friend to warn them or count the cost. The British government, their relief was, again, the whole philosophy that underpinned it, really suggested that relief should be minimal and it should be given in such a way that the recipient 
couldn't take advantage of it and that the recipient had to do something in return. And this was the philosophy behind the public works, which after the second failure of the potato crop in 1846, public works remain the main form of relief. But in fact, they'd been used before, but the type of works used after 1846 were very harsh. Professor Christine Keneally, Director of the Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, USA. So people who wanted a minimum wage, and wages were kept deliberately low, had to work six days a week, 12 hours a day, doing hard physical labour. And as you can imagine, people who are already hungry, the amount of calories and energy expended, it was really disastrous for people who were suffering anyway. And because they'd been um, without a lot of food the previous year, were very vulnerable. So it wasn't a great scheme. But part of the philosophy of the public works was that they weren't to serve any really useful purpose. They were purely used as a test of destitution. So they were a very cruel test of destitution. And because they were a test of destitution, the British government imposed various checks and balances because they didn't want to be taken advantage of. So they were incredibly bureaucratic. And in some instances, it took six to eight weeks for these public works to be set up, by which time people were really on the verge of starvation or were dead. So in many ways, the public works were just so ill-suited to this situation. And even though they were ill-suited, people wanted to get on the public works because there was nothing else for them. And so the public works could never meet the demand for them. And in the first half of 1847, the British government stopped the public works and eventually opened up a soup kitchen relief scheme in its place. So just how effective was this new approach? Peter Gray, Professor of Modern History at Queen's University, Belfast. We know that at one point during the famine, the state did intervene effective, relatively effectively, feeding over three and a half million people in July 1847 and relatively you know, stopping the on- onset of famine. After that, I think the state can be held most culpable because it withdraws virtually from any form of, of central assistance to the localities, particularly the West in Ireland, which is by the, union, the poor law unions are bankrupt and you know, there's a mass wave of evictions. Now, on, you, know, you, ha- you have to take into consideration that the Britain is going through a major financial crisis in 1847. There's a run on the banks. There's, there's problems with credit markets. On the other hand, the price of food is falling very rapidly from a, a peak in early 1847. It's half what it had been by the late summer, basically because of massive imports coming in from North America. So it would have been relatively cheap to continue the form of assistance that had been delivered in the summer of 1847. But the, the combination of, I think, a perception of a financial crisis, a political backlash against, we, in the, on the part of the British public, we've done too much for Ireland. They're still threatening to engage in revolution. They're still engaging in, in uh, rural violence. We cannot help these people anymore. They're going to help themselves. That's the kind of perception that leads through to this withdrawal of responsibility. And I think certainly there's a large element of culpability on the part of the both the state and the, the political public, the British middle classes, for that withdrawal of, of a And as historian Peter Gray just touched on, in the second half of 1847, the British government felt that it had done enough for Ireland. As a result, it officially declared that the famine in Ireland was over. Jury mourn. It was largely the Treasury that was responsible because they had responsibility for relief operations. And by 1848, you had an official communicate from the Treasury that the famine in Ireland had come to an end. However, the famine was far from over. The situation was that you still did not have enough food to feed the people, largely because a potato crop had not been planted for the harvest of 1848. And you also then had the situation in 1849 where the potato crop was once again affected by blight. So that even though 1848, officially the government maintains that the famine has come to an end, Really, it is not until 1850, and the impact of the famine, of course, continues on until 1852 because of large-scale evictions that are taking place from 1848 onwards when you have anything between a quarter and half a million people turned off their lands. It definitely, without a doubt, 
uh, government policy at the time left a lot to be desired where it came to famine relief, it, without a doubt. Galway City historian Willie Henry. Like, you know, to announce it and the famine was over, like, was absolutely ridiculous, like, you know, and the, the people, the amount of people that were dying here, still right up to 1850 and beyond. You know, the, like, the famine didn't just end, like, it was all over. We, we got to 1850 and we were all home and dry, you know, it wasn't like that. So why did the British government more or less wash its hands of the Irish famine crisis after the year 1847? North Curry historian Brian McMahon. I would agree with this historian James S. Donnelly who says that Ireland wasn't really treated as a part of the empire, a real integral part of the empire. And if the British authorities had that attitude of treating Ireland as they might have treated a part of Sussex or Hampshire or somewhere like that, that things might have been a lot different, you know. So that trail leads right back to Trevelyan and the administration in in London. Well, let's be honest, the British government were responsible for all their citizens equally, and they should have treated all of them equally. They seem to have a blind eye when it came to looking at Ireland. They just did not treat them as equals. I doubt if this had happened in rural England, would they have allowed so many people to suffer so badly. It was lack of knowledge, definitely. They didn't, but but not complete lack of ignorance either. Let's face it, they, they had numerous commissions were set up in the years prior to the famine, informing them on the conditions of Ireland. Kathleen Villiers Tuttle, Connemara historian and author of the book, Patient Endurance, The Great Famine in Connemara. Here's Willie Henry. Well, I would say that the, the British government was certainly, without doubt, from my research, from what I've studied of this, there is a huge responsibility for what happened here. It, it has to be laid clearly at the feet of, of, of Parliament and the British government. They were warned on numerous occasions between 1800 and 1845. There were 84 reports went into the into the British government to say there was a catastrophe just waiting to happen in Ireland. And in fact, when it did hit strike, they buried their heads in the sand and they insisted that things weren't as bad here as what they what they were. Uh, now, you had then the London Illustrated News reporters coming over, you had the artists coming over, and they visited the Cork area, and you had Skibbereen and Skull and these areas, and they were shocked. And they brought it to the public's attention in England and that was one of the reasons that the British reacted in the small manner that they did and it was it was far too little what they did do What is clear from the commentary so far in this programme is that colossal mistakes were made by the Russell-led British government during the famine with disastrous consequences for Ireland But what about the British general public? How did they react to news of the famine when the likes of the London Illustrated News got the story into the public realm? Professor Liam Kennedy of Queen's University, Belfast. There's no doubt that the initial reaction of the British public to the the Great Famine was a sympathetic one, and that was demonstrated in the large contributions to the the British Association, the biggest British charity uh, relating to the famine in Ireland, giving, you know, in total over £400,000, which was a massive sum in those days. The mass of ordinary people working in mills, factories and shops throughout Britain gave generously to help Ireland in the first half of 1847. Professor Christine Keneally. Most of the towns and cities in Britain actually had committees and some were larger than others and they raised large amounts of money. So probably the largest donations came from a committee in the north of England in Manchester who raised over £10,000, which again, if you multiply by 100, you can see it's considerable. Liverpool didn't have a committee because it was, at that time, a very sectarian city, but a lot of individual donations came from Liverpool. But other cities did have committees. Birmingham, London had a number of committees, etc. Of all donations, I think probably the one that continues to move me much is the story of the warrior 
And this was a prison ship, as they were called, Hulk, H-U-L-K. And by the mid-1840s, prisons in Britain were overflowing, and so the solution was to use all decommissioned ships as prisons. And the most hardened of prisoners were put on these ships, and they were really treated abysmally. They were essentially cheap dock labour, and they had to work, and they worked in chain gangs, and they usually worked in water, so dreadful, dreadful conditions. And there was one of these prison ships in Woolwich in England, in London, and the convicts on board it apparently saw food being sent to Ireland and asked for some reason if they could contribute. And they were given permission to contribute, and they made a donation. And the donation was in pennies and halfpennies, tiny amounts of money. And in total, they raised 17 shillings, which in the scheme of what was sent to the British Relief Association might seem quite small. But in terms of what that donation meant to them was enormous. And I was very moved by this story and I decided to find out more about these prisoners and I found that they were actually the subject of some debates in the British Parliament because they were so poorly treated. And because of these debates I was able to track them and I found that by the following year each of those people was dead. Unfortunately also by the following year British public giving to Ireland declined massively. Liam Kennedy. I suppose the problem is that as time went on with disease-ridden emigrants turning up at Liverpool and Glasgow and in British cities, sympathy for the Irish declined. And this seems to be a feature of modern famines as well, that we're initially inclined to be quite generous But then famine fatigue sets in and we give less and less. And Britain in the 1840s, later 1840s, is a classic example of that. In terms of who's to blame for the great Irish famine, if one thinks of Irish history as a giant docker trial, then clearly the British government would be in it. But who else, apart from the government, was to blame? What about the Irish landlord class in possession of large landed estates? who numbered about 10,000 at the time of the famine. Historian Willie Henry. In fairness, there were a lot of landlords trying to do their best for their tenantry. In fact, a lot of the landlords lost everything themselves. There were other, of course, other landlords that were just unscrupulous, but that you were going to get that anyway. You know, we have the same thing today with the banks. We have a couple of good guys, we have a lot of bad guys, you know, but they're all painted now with the one brush. But the problem with the, the landlord system was, the landlord system was actually evil to, to a certain extent. It was, you know. The evil was that the landlord system was chronically rotten from within. Historian Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee of Ireland. Landlords certainly get a lot of stick for it what happened in the famine and there were certainly individual landlords who were horrendous but I think it's more the system rather than the individual landlords because many of the uh, landlords throughout Ireland by the 1840s were in very poor financial circumstances and they didn't have the resources for doing anything because the system was rotten And from the 18th century, the landed estates had been mismanaged. More money was being taken out of them rather than reinvested in them. And they were just an economic shambles. Many of them, not all of them. Let's look at how individual estates and landlords managed that crisis. And some of them were absolutely barbaric. And every ogre we can imagine and that we've been taught about, they did exist. No two ways about it. Jim Rees, County Wicklow historian and author of the book, A Farewell to Famine. But there were some landlords who, within the parameters of their own morals of the time, did try their best. In Wicklow here, we had, down around southwest Wicklow, we had the Fitzwilliam Estate. Well, when I say the southwest Wicklow, it's quite extensive. In fact, they owned one-sixth of the county, over 90,000 acres, 22,000 tenants. The Fitzwilliam Estate realised before that that so many of the holdings had been broken up and Irish people were living on 
one acre, half an acre, uh, maybe up to five acres at best. And this just wasn't economically viable. The nude was going to have to be a restructuring. That was going to have to take place anyway. That would mean getting rid of people off the estate, sent them out. And it's how they went about this. Another reason for getting people off your estate was there was a change in 1847 in the Relief Act where that allowed outdoor relief to be paid for the first time, but also trying to get people... The workhouses by this time were totally overcrowded, totally inadequate, and the rates were being increased on the landlords. So the landlord said, we need these people off the land because we cannot afford this year after year after year. And so many estates did go bankrupt. A lot of estates, a lot of people, we talk about NAMA now. Well, we had a NAMA 150 years ago. It was called the Encumbered Estates Courts, where estates went bankrupt and they were bought over by the government and then resold to entrepreneurs and what have you. But it's how did landlords go about this? It separates the wheat from the chaff. And some of them went about it in a more humane way than others. Some, particularly over west, round Roscommon, round Leitrim, was simply a question to turf people out. And you had mortality rates on famine ships going across the Atlantic, up to 40% in some cases. Absolutely crazy. You might have 350 people on board a ship and 150 would arrive. So you had, um, here in Wicklow, the big one of the biggest clearances in the country was on the Fitzwilliam estate in South Wicklow. And that was extremely well organised. There was mortality rate of well under, I haven't got a figure off the top of my head, but I know it's well under 5%. Any death is regrettable. Any death is terrible. But the more I read about and research the conditions on board these ships and the way the people survive, I, I'm always amazed that the death rate wasn't higher right across the board. But the Fitzwilliams estate did try to do it more humanely. This was in contrast to how Dennis Mann of Strokestown in County Roscommon shipped his tenants out to Canada. Dr Kieran O'Reilly of Maynooth University. In 1847, Dennis Mann undertakes an assisted emigration scheme where he ships 1,490 people off to Canada. He's murdered six months later as a result when, when news filters back to the local community that almost half of those have died en route to Gros Isle. But in the famine narrative, the famine, the social memory of the famine in, in Roscommon, that prevails. I think the most surprising thing uh, for me is the other things that happened during the famine which have largely been forgotten and deliberately forgotten, and, and that is the behaviour of the local community. Beyond the British establishment and the Irish landlord class. The next major power group in Ireland was the Irish middle class. This group mainly comprised medium to large sized Catholic farming families. So did they do enough to alleviate famine suffering? Historian Liam Kennedy. The Irish middle class, you know, mainly Catholic, the larger farmers, middling sized farmers, uh, it's not obvious to me that they did as much as they might have done during the famine. And some clearly dismissed their cottiers and labourers, you know, and pushed them out onto the roadsides. There was almost that element in Irish society, the Gambian man, who was there as the middleman, always prepared to turn a shilling, no matter what the circumstances. We still have him. And we still have the guys who make money in the boom times and then also make money in the bad times because we've always had that. And we were there and these have been, these are the ones who have been exonerated. That Irish middle class, that Gumbinism. And that definitely was a case where a farmer who was doing slightly better than his neighbour was quick to jump in to acquire that land that people had been evicted from. Now, it has to be said economically, it has to be said, these amalgamations had to take place to make things viable. But it was the degree, you only ever hear of, oh, well, the landlord kicked these some people off and the Holdens were amalgamated. Well, the Holdens wouldn't have been amalgamated if there weren't Irish people there prepared to take on the evicted land. <laughs> 
County Wicklow historian Jim Rees. Here's County Kildare historian Frank Taff. It was Irish men. Not the absentee landlords. The absentee landlords were at the very top of the pyramid, let's put it that way. But it was the Irish middleman, the Gombean man, who was causing most of the problems for his fellow Irish people, uh, fellow Irish men. And this is where the large problem was. There were too many people meddling in the landletting uh, system, you know. And the man at the very end with the family, the the wife and the small family, and with an acre or a half acre or whatever it was, trying to eke a living and had to pay rent as well. That's where the problems all started and finished. A classic example of one such meddlesome Irish gombean man, being Charles Carey in a thigh in County Kildare. Historian Kieran O'Reilly. The world of, of Charles Carey, a middleman in, in a thigh in County Kildare, is very interesting. He's a middleman on the Duke of Leinster's estate and as the famine progresses, the squeeze is put on him from the Duke of Leinster effectively to pay his rent. Um, so where we see Carey in a forgiving mood and you know, and, and he gives relief to his own under tenants and he provides assistance for them in 1846 and 1847, as the famine wears on, as the squeeze has been put on, on Carey from the Duke of Leinster, Therefore, Carey puts the squeeze on his own under tenants and his attitude towards them is very interesting and, and enlightening as well. He delights in 1848 at the, at the emigration of a large amount of people from Athai and the surrounding areas of the Leinster estate and uh, is symptomatic of the prevailing attitudes at the time. We see it in other towns like Borough as well where the Border Guardians there are, by 1848, kind of effectively fed up with the situation, uh, fed up with providing relief for people. So people like Carey in in Inathai delight at the emigration of people. I think this fantastic quote by him in his own personal diaries where he says, America is going to be stung now with these beggars and brats which we're sending over to them. And effectively he wishes them well with that. Don't forget, one of the things that happened, one of the consequences of the famine, Ireland experienced an economic boom uh, in the 1850s, simply because the poorest of the poor had been shipped off across the Atlantic or wherever. And so there was more, less poor people and more people who had a bit of wherewithal to develop the thing. And so there was an economic boom there. So people, Irish, local, the shopkeeper, the publican, the auctioneer, whatever, all these people actually benefited from the famine. And if you think, I remember, the famine was very, very seldom touched on when I was going to school in the 60s, 50s and 60s. And it wasn't until the 1990s, the 150th anniversary and the commemorations and all the research went in. And for the first time, instead of something being researched at national level, there were so many local historians, so many local societies looked at what happened in their area. And this started to come out that people being prepared, Irish people being prepared to take advantage of this situation. And that definitely did happen. And it's about time that that came out and was seen. And I think maybe that is why up to then the famine was never really mentioned because the people who survived actually benefited. So they didn't want to say anything. Cottle Porter, he did, going back to the folklore accounts of it, if you went to it, the famine never really happened anywhere in Ireland. It always happened five miles down the road. No matter where you were, well, it wasn't too bad here, but my God, five miles down the road was brutal. So you go five miles down the road and you hear the same story. And uh, so this was gone. Nobody in any particular area was prepared to say how bad the famine was in their area because, by definition, they were the survivors. They were the ones whose ancestors actually made from it. And as historian Jim Rees just touched on, some Irish people were very willing to take advantage of the famine crisis and exploit their fellow Irish people. Historian William Whelan of Waterford County Museum, situated in Dungarvan in County Waterford, divulges one incident which occurred in Dungarvan Workhouse. 
one of the interesting things as well that I didn't realise until we did a bit of research on it was the extent at which the workhouse was actually administered by inmates themselves. That at the very top of the hierarchy you had the, the master and matron and you had one or two professional people underneath them like the doctor and so on and so forth. But uh, a lot of the auxiliary nurses, the cookhouse staff, they were all inmates who would have gotten a reward of perhaps porter or extra food in return for doing their work. Now, one of the problems with that actually was that it led to an awful lot of soft corruption. One of the very interesting things that we unearthed was that within the bakehouse out in Dungarvan workhouse, uh, it was controlled by a single family. And if I, if I can use a, a modern example, they were very close to the Sopranos and the way that they behaved. I mean, the, there was a chap um, when he saw members from the, the visiting committee, these people that came around regularly to inspect the workhouses, he ran across the square calling for their attention. And uh, he was set upon by members of his family and he was kicked quite severely by them. And uh, the visiting committee actually had to tell these people to unhand him. And they did, and he. Whereupon this chap came out with this story, which was sub- subsequently proved to be true. He said that the family in question were taking large amounts of the bread for their own use and reselling it to people within the workhouse. Uh, when it was investigated, there was an entire room of black bread found within the Dungarvan workhouse, and there was also a large tarpaulin found of black bread buried at the bottom of the workhouse. Now, so what you might think. But at this time in Dungarvan Workhouse, the master had given the order to weed the yard because the people were so hungry they were actually eating the weeds. So within this context, people were actually running this, what can only be described as half of a protection racket, I suppose. And they were burying the bread and leaving the bed, bread rot because if they gave it away for free, they'd undermine their own market. And what they were also doing, we discovered, is uh, they were smuggling the bread out of the workhouse and selling it normally by throwing it over the wall, but as well it went out in coffins. Now this is documented, it's not a, a folk tale, it's within the minutes of the, wor- the workhouse books. So, uh, so it was verified after a full and thorough investigation. A, yeah, like I know that when you're dealing with an awful lot of Irish history, sometimes you come up against folk tales and when you scratch the surface, the story isn't quite what it seems to be. But these, this, this is actually a very correct and very true story. And we have pretty much the, the deposition of the poor law, the, the visiting committee at the time, and we have the master and the matron, their reports on the situation. So this, is, this all happened. And uh, as I said, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I think there's, there's too much has been made of... I suppose all of the the harm that was done to Ireland by, let's say, the British administrators or the English administrators, I think sometimes you have to look at at, at some of the middlemen who are very often Irish themselves, or even in this case, these people were very poor people, just like their fellow inmates, and they inflicted this misery on them. and veering away from Irish people exploiting their own in workhouses and getting back to the hot issue of who's to blame for the Great Irish Famine, beyond the British government and the Irish landlord class and also the Irish Catholic middle class, who else might possibly be to blame? What about Irish members of Parliament of the time? Liam Kennedy of Queen's University, Belfast. There's the Irish... Parliamentary representatives, the um, Daniel O'Connell's repeal party. I mean, it's a striking thing that the Gregory Clause, which, you know, has has a very bad reputation and rightly so, um, that only three Irish MPs in the House of Commons voted against that. I mean, they criticised it later, but at the time. um, The Young Irelanders at times more concerned about some form of Irish independence rather than facing what was the crucial issue facing the Irish people, which was famine, disease, starvation. So uh, there's a whole range of people to varying degrees, the more privileged sections of British society, of Irish society, who bear a responsibility for the Great Famine. And what about the various churches in Ireland? Did the likes of the Roman Catholic Church do enough to alleviate famine suffering? Believe it or not, while the Vatican did huge work to mobilise the international Catholic community to help Ireland, nevertheless certain Irish bishops had their own priorities. Historian Kieran O'Reilly In 1849, Bishop Cantwell of Mead is 
raising large subscriptions uh, in the county. Over a thousand pounds is gathered in 1849 alone, and that money has been sent to Pope Pius the Ninth in Rome for the upkeep of St Peter's Basilica. So, on one hand, while money has been sent from Rome for the relief of Irish people during the famine, money has been is being raised in in places like Mead, which particularly badly hit there are parts of Mead which are as badly hit old castle kells places like that which are as badly affected as parts of the west of ireland are you got some of the hierarchy who completely turned their back on it you got others who did organize thing but it's particularly when you come down to parish level you would get most of the relief committees you would get the parish priest on the relief committees. Some of them were very, very active. And it curates as well. I have absolutely no doubt that some of them put themselves in danger of contagion because there were more people killed by disease during the famine than actual hunger. Historian Jim Rees. Here's Professor Christine Keneally of Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, USA. There are many myths about the famine and one is that your priests, Catholic priests didn't play a full role and that they didn't die and that they were living very well. And again, the story is far more complex. No doubt there were some priests who didn't do enough to help their flock, but many priests did. Um, One of the conditions of the British government when they set up the local relief committees after 1845 was they didn't allow Catholic priests to sit on them. So Catholic priests weren't allowed to play an official role and as Nath Nicholson who went to Ireland she was full of praise for the priests she encountered and she said even though they're excluded from official relief committees they are doing so much to help their poor and if you think what they had to do in terms of trying to give the last rites they weren't getting any income at the time because their income would mostly have been derived from people getting married, getting baptised. People weren't. We know all those usual practices just stopped during the famine. So priests did give their lives. And by working with the poor, they were, again, putting their lives in risk, people who had fever, etc. So the role of the Catholic Church, it's, again, it's a story that really needs to be uncovered. And I think as more research is done, especially at the local level, more stories will emerge about the great sacrifices made by Catholic priests, by Protestant ministers who worked to help the poor. When the famine struck, both the Catholic and the Protestant clergy. They were very, very active in relief right through the famine. These are all kind of heroic figures in many ways, putting their lives often at risk. People of the Protestant faith and the Anglicans and the Presbyterians, some of them went out of their way to try and alleviate some of the suffering. Irish Catholic priests similarly suffered a heavy attrition rate. They worked so hard and so diligently, they actually died from exhaustion, a number of them. This pattern of of just really heroic people coming to their best in this time of emergency and often losing their lives as a result. When the famine came to Ireland, many clergy mobilised to help the poor and tend the sick, untold numbers gave their lives. Victims of a fever, an evil curse that spread With a vengeance through the country to leave a million dead Ever since the Great Famine occurred over a century and a half ago, various social commentators have compared it to genocide. So just how right is it to make this comparison? Historian Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee of Ireland. No way. It it just, it's an argument that doesn't hold water in the least. It's taking a a massive step too far. You've got a government that believes in laissez-faire, that believes in non-government intervention, and they're forced into a position where they have to do some kind of intervention, which isn't enough. But there is a massive difference between believing that you shouldn't intervene on the one hand and deliberately not intervening so that you'll kill everybody off. That's just that this, to my knowledge, there is no evidence whatsoever. <laughs> 
for that kind of belief. On the issue of genocide, um, which is a point of view put forward by some writers, uh, no serious historian takes that view. And comparisons between the Great Irish Famine and the Jewish Holocaust, for instance, are, I think, are both insulting to Jewish peoples and to victims of the Great Famine, because really their graves are being ransacked for propagandist political purposes. Professor Liam Kennedy. Here's Jim Rees. I can really understand where that argument does get currency. I can understand where it comes from. But again, it's too simplistic. I have not the slightest doubt that there were many Tory MPs particularly who would have wanted that. But I think the vast majority was, it was a way of dealing or not dealing with any crisis that presented itself at the time. Don't forget the horrific as the conditions were in Ireland. Conditions in working class Manchester, Liverpool, London, uh, Newcastle were every bit as bad. They treated their own people, their own working class people, with absolutely horrifically. And I don't think that was an intent to wipe them out. But it's just the Irish... Put it this way, there were so many cases, uh, you're talking about putting people in the dock, the politicians and everyone else kind of put God in the dock and said, this has been the judgment of God on these Irish people for the way they live and everything else. And I don't think that it's, some of them looked on it from a religious point of view. Yes, they should be made so far. Yes, it should. So you got that aspect. You got others from a political economy point of view. The Malthusian argument. The Malthusian argument. Famine and war will get rid of excess. We'll get rid of excess. And this is very much what Trevelyan, who was over the Treasury at the time, uh, Trevelyan said, we go by a a laissez-faire tradition here. We are not pumping public money into private enterprise or vice versa. We're not going to upset the private enterprise, apple cart and the free market and so on. So there was that it was very much a question of the genocide is too strong a word for it because when you think of genocide you're thinking about what happened in Rwanda what happened in parts of Central Europe uh, what happened with with the Jewish people with the Nazis that was active you got them up you rounded them up you killed as many as possible that didn't happen but that's what I can say I can lean more towards the kind of passive genocide in that this hunger was allowed to happen and that's where I see it but it's trying to we're trying to judge it by today's standards I'm not letting these guys off the hook but I don't think it was an actual genocide policy it was just the way they thought at the time and they just didn't really care And historian Liam Kennedy also had this pertinent comment to make. Some regiments of the British Army in Ireland, and also some policemen, made voluntary collections and channelled charitable aid to the starving people. Now, of course, there's another side to that as well, which is that the police and the army also aided landlords in evicting tenants who'd fallen into arrears. So it's a mixed message. But it is interesting that even on the part of those who were administering the coercive side of the state, nonetheless, they engaged voluntarily in charitable activity. And of course, it does run absolutely counter to any notions of genocidal intentions and so on. I don't subscribe to the view that the British government was engaged in genocide. I don't subscribe to that at all. County Donegal historian Sean Beatty. And I don't think there was a deliberate ploy to destroy the, the Irish population. They certainly had discussed things like uh, migration as a means of reducing the population. And uh, those schemes died out, you know, as the 19th century wore on. Mm-hmm. 
and staying for the moment with the topic of government-assisted migration, which historian Sean Beatty just mentioned, perhaps the best-known migration scheme run by the British government during the famine was the Earl Grey Orphan Emigration Scheme, which shipped over 4,000 Irish workhouse girls from Irish workhouses to a better life in Australia. Margaret Hogan of Burr Historical Society in County Offaly. This was one good thing that the government in England did because generally they weren't at all generous to the Irish poor. But this was really organised from London and um, I suppose it was organised really to bring women to Australia where there was a shortage of women. But the girls really would have done better in Australia than they would have done in Ireland at the time. I think it has to be seen as one of the great success stories of British government in the mid-19th century. Now, there's a lot of unsuccessful stories of British government, particularly applied to Ireland. Richard Reid, historian from Canberra in Australia and author of the book Farewell My Children, Irish Assisted Emigration to Australia, 1848 to 1870. When we look at the way the, you know, the British government or the, you know, the British authorities in London, in particular, the House of Commons, House of Lords, the whole British establishment handled the famine in Ireland, we can see all sorts of deficiencies and and uh, culpabilities or whatever, if you, if you like, in that. But those who managed to get themselves on an assisted boat to Australia, they can thank people like the Land and Immigration Commissioners, whose job it was within the British Colonial Office to organise these voyages. From the workhouse to Australia, a new life began. Taken from starvation by the bold Earl Grey plan. A brighter day beckoned across the far sea. The workhouse girls hoped for a life to be free. From hunger and torment and famine's dark cloud From the workhouse to Australia to live and be proud Four thousand girls travelled to Australia's far shore With the Earl Grey scheme's blessing to prosperity's door However, it's very important to put the success of the Earl Grey scheme in the proper context of the wider famine crisis engulfing Ireland and the Irish workhouse system. Count Galera historian Frank Taff. It would be regardless of success in terms of the opportunities it gave to the 4,000 odd girls to left, but in terms of the attempts to rid the Irish workhouses of the uh, excessive numbers of children. Bear in mind, it was 55,000 children under 18 years of age in the workhouses at that time. So only a little over 4,000 uh, were taken away. So it, it wasn't a success in that regard. In other words, it was just a drop in the ocean of what was needed to alleviate overall Irish famine suffering. The British government, which ruled Ireland during the famine, was left with the poisoned legacy of over 500 years of vicious conquest, colonisation and mismanagement in Ireland. All these negatives put together created a disaster of epic proportions, with the failure of the potato crop for five years running, from 1845 to 1850. So could any government, even a British one detested by nationalist Ireland, have saved the situation? Historian William Whelan of Waterford County Museum. Certainly they could have presented a more human face, I think, once the famine had struck and once the full extent of it had been seen. But they didn't. But this is a government of its time. I don't want to excuse them of absolutely everything. But I think it needs to be placed in context. We've, we've heard so many brickbats thrown against them. They, they could have done better, but they probably couldn't have prevented the famine, I think would be my synopsis of it. Lord John Russell and Sir Edward Trevelyan, who was in charge of famine relief operations, their belief in the summer of 1847, late summer of 1847, is that the famine is ended. In fact, there are two to three more years of famine, depending on what part of the country you're talking about. Professor Liam Kennedy of Queen's University, Belfast. So there's a failure of imagination, failure of policy, there is self-interest... There's 
a degree of ruthlessness on the part of Irish landlords. You have massive evictions during the Great Famine. Probably several hundred thousand people uh, evicted during the, the course of the Great Famine. Landlords would say they were heavily indebted, they couldn't afford the poor rates, that the tenants were not paying their rents. I mean, there are elements of truth in all of that, but at the end of the day, the, the landlord class and the British government failed the great mass of the people. Nevertheless, to place 100% blame on the British government and the Irish landlord class is to perhaps let others off the hook. County Wicklow historian Jim Rees. If you do point the finger at one group, you're letting everybody else off the hook. And what we do by pointing is say, to the British government, to the landlords, we're letting our own people off the hook who were in there making money on the side, who were uh, every bit as culpable. And we get the situation where then we can say, right, we'll kick the British and the landlords out. But we replace them with exactly the same ilk of people who just happen to have Irish accents. But we don't really change anything. And that, to me, is the danger. That if the system is wrong and needs to be changed, change the system. But don't start blaming one group and replacing it with another group who think exactly the same way. That doesn't work. That's what we've seen hasn't worked. As a kind of summing up on that, it's not a black and white issue of the English in some vague sense or ideological sense responsible for everything that went on in Ireland. It's a much more complex picture than that. If I could maybe make a contemporary point, I mean, Ireland has still not signed up. The United Nations recommends that each developed country, and we clearly are one of those developed countries, gives 0.7% of its gross national income in foreign aid to developing countries. And we still haven't reached that target. No, we're not the only ones. Many other countries in Europe haven't either. The Scandinavian countries are the best. So... Again, I think that underlines the point that um, it's easy to suggest that others should be charitable, but it's not actually, and it's certainly painful, it's not that easy to do it oneself. funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.